A very strange thing happened at the beginning of this gospel we just read. You might not have noticed it at first, uh, but just as Jesus said, setting out on a journey, he's interrupted by this young man. And he's not just any young man, but a young, wealthy ruler. He seems to be sincere, this truly religious youngster. And I think he means it when he starts his talk like with Jesus by calling him a good teacher. But then oddly enough, Jesus berates him for saying this when only God and not any human should be called good. And the question he had for Jesus, it's, it's one we all ask in our hearts and if we don't say it out loud. What must I do to inherit eternal life? In fact, I'll also pair it with another question, which we, another that we all have. What happens when we die? What happens when we die? Let's we'll start with the first question. The young man tells Jesus how he's always kept all the laws that his Judaic faith required. And that's at this point that Jesus follows up his scolding of the young ruler with one of the only moments we hear in scripture where he expresses emotion about another person. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He looks at this young man and realizes that this young adult had been living what he thought was the goal of religious life, to do all the things and keep all the rules that the law demands and get himself into heaven. But lovingly, lovingly impressed by the young man's zeal, Jesus directs him on how to reset those goals and to the one thing that really, really matters. The one thing that really, really matters. The one thing that will allow him to become rich in the only thing that counts, divesting oneself of an attachment to things, and to empty oneself to make room for God to enter in with grace. Shifting one's goals from getting into heaven to expanding the self one will have when one reaches the end of life's journey. From saving one's soul to making one's soul, building one's soul. As Shelley Matthews of Bright Divinity School in Houston says, making a soul is different, a different project altogether, a lifelong task of cultivating wisdom, humility, righteous anger, loving kindness, mercy, and hospitality. This is the path down which Jesus attempts to lead the seeker. But the young ruler is shocked, shocked. But the size, the enormity of what Jesus asks him to give up. Depart with everything he thinks makes him socially acceptable. His wealth, his status, all of his stuff, all of his wealth. God, when you think about it, and you know this well, God always asks of us the hard thing. God always asks of us the hard thing. And in this case, Jesus asks him and us not to make our goal an insurance policy to heaven, but to, to become open to enriching the soul while we're here. The young man doesn't understand that prosperity can be an encumbrance. And he walks away heartbroken. If, you know, if we know anything about the culture in which the young, young man lived, we would understand this. Because in those days, uh, they believed that the wealthy were favored by God. That God had allowed them to accumulate, what, the, what God had allowed them to get, accumulate proved how superior they were to the over and above the poor, who themselves identified as morally powerless in the face of wealth and power. Powerful men in these days of patriarchy actually had power of life and death over people. 
And in many ways, this concept of wealth resembles the prosperity gospel we've all seen in today's get-rich-quick TV preacher Christianity. You know, it's, it's a false goal. Does this mean, by the way, that God hates rich people and blocks them from heaven? Absolutely not. You know that in my career as a fundraiser, I worked with many, many very wealthy people. And I was also privileged to work with many rich people who genuinely got it. They got the purpose of what they had. That their wealth was a mandate from God to make a difference for other people who were not so lucky. Wealthy people who empty themselves in this process they prove that they're not owned by their wealth, but use their resources to slide through the eye of the needle with wisdom, to do the work that God gave them to do. God asks all of us to do the hard thing by giving ourselves over to God. So, Jesus gives us the answer to that first question about eternal life. He promises us the fullness of life, real life, real life, not just when we die, but right now, right now, right now. When our daily life, we empty ourselves into God's will. But that now leaves that other question I left hanging out here. What happens when we die? Now, if you think you're going to leave here today with the ability to say, Pastor Pat told us exactly what happens to us when we die. You're wrong. Because I don't have the answers. I have some answers, but they are ones that mean something to me and probably wouldn't mean something to you, but I'll share a few this morning. But the thing is, many of us have had our own experiences. But this question of what happens when we die often doesn't become validated until we've had an experience or we've seen something that indicates to us that there is life beyond this life. That people love us beyond this life and they're waiting for us beyond this life. Your own experience <clears throat> will point you to the truth of what lies ahead. Jesus wants us to be transformed as you heard in the Gospel. And you've heard that a number of times this year. Transformed. As a, there's an old saying that goes, God loves us enough to welcome us just as we are, but God loves us too much to let us stay that way. So, I was just talking yesterday online with a young woman who told, told me, well, she, somebody else had started this topic, about life and death. And she's told me that she never really thought <clears throat> much about or believed in life after death until her mother had died. And she said, about a year and a half later, after mom passed, my, my daughter was born. I never really talked to her about mom. Then one day, when my little girl was three years old, I had some old pictures, uh, and I had them out on a table. My daughter came over and picked up a picture of my mom. And she looked at it and she says, hey, this is the nice lady who comes and sits on my bed and talks to me when I'm scared or sad. She says she does this because her name is Grandma. I had my own experience with my grandmother. We, I used to call her Gami. I didn't get Grammy done. I got Gami done. And so I was very close with her, especially after my own mother died when I was 16. So at age 80, I used to go shopping with her. She loved going shopping with Pat and modeling clothes for me. So we go to the department store where she put on these clothes and come out and to show me. And she would always say, now you don't think this is too old womanish, do you? I loved her. But time catches up with everyone. When she was 91, she started labeling her belongings <clears throat> to, to, as to who should get what when she died. One day I got a call that I better get up to Syracuse because Gami was dying. 
When I arrived at her place, I found her in bed, but she had had cataract surgery and they didn't have her glasses on. And that's a, a sure way to get people to dissociate. Nobody thought of this, so I went over and put her glasses on. And she immediately turned and said, oh, thank you, Patricia. And we talked for a while. And then she turned to the left side of the bed, where she began to converse with people that I couldn't see. And it became quickly apparent to me that she was talking to every single one of my female relatives who had already passed. My mother, my grandmother's sister, her daughter, her cousins. It was like listening to only one side of a phone conversation where you could tell who was on the other line. So my invisible relatives at one point told her something funny, obviously, because she started to laugh. And it seemed like at one point they were asking her to come with them. And she said, no, not yet. And then she turned to me and started just chatting as she had been with the people on the other side of the bed. So we talked for a while, and then she returned to her celestial conversation. She seemed to scan the group that she could see and I couldn't for someone who was missing and looked puzzled. Then she said to them, where's Nell? Well, I knew that they answered because she then said, oh, you see, Nell, her sister-in-law, hadn't died yet, and she wasn't in the celestial group. The entire experience was like having, for me, like having one foot in eternity and one foot here. A short while later, after we left the room for a few minutes, my mother slipped into sleep and then joined them on the other side. But it's been one of the most important things to me to reinforce with me that there's life behind life. The thing is, you know, every belief system, even atheism, has among its concepts what happens when we die. Yeah, you know, take, take the Sufis. It's very reminiscent of today's gospel that the Sufis quote their spiritual leader, Ansari, who said, know that when you lose, when you, when you learn to lose yourself, you will reach the beloved, God, eternal afterlife. <coughs> there is no other secret to be learned, he said, and more than this is not known to me. Now, according to Harvard professor, Jacob Olapona, the Yoruba people of Nigeria believe that death doesn't end a person's life, but instead marks a passage from one realm of existence to another. Uh, they believe that there is an, an afterlife, or as they call it, an after death, in which the living dead exist as part of the sacred cosmos. This, that sacredness of life is at the very core of India's Jain religion. Their great leader, Mahavira, taught the principles of truth and nonviolence. And by nonviolence, they meant that they held sacred every living thing and could do no violence. They could not even do violence to microbes. So long before we were wearing these masks, the Jains wore masks to keep themselves from inhaling tiny pieces of life. <coughs> and very much like Francis of Assisi, who we visited last week, and Francis was a wealthy young man, and, and uh, he divested himself of his wealth and his family. Mahavira was born into a wealthy family, but abandoned it all. Interestingly enough, the James don't recognize a God, but believe in the transmigration of the soul, which is eternal, like the universe itself. The body may die, but the soul reincarnates in any of a million species, which is why it's pretty good to keep be kind to animals. What do atheists think about death? Well, most don't believe in an afterlife, there are some who embrace naturalism, 
where that is where there's only there's only one kind of stuff in the universe, and we're all made of that same stuff. And any encounter with another person that can help explain to us our experience of living helps them. But let's return to the moment of Judaism that we saw earlier with the rich young man. Unlike Christianity and Islam, that view, view themselves as universal religions, Judaism is conceived, is conceived as a religion for a specific people, the Jews. And Professor George Yancey uh, at Rutgers says, there's less stress, and you can hear this in the gospel, there's less stress on belief and much more on practice. As in keeping many laws that the young man said he kept today. In Judaism, it's how you live your religion in your daily life. That covenant we find in the Hebrew Bible is not about death. It's about life and what you do in life. The whole concept about an afterlife in a place called heaven didn't exist for the Jews until around about the time these actual events we read about today took place during the rabbinic period. But what about us? What about congregations? What do we believe? But we believe that eternal life is a gift of pure grace. Pure grace. As UCC minister Thomas Kinder, who practices up in Bradford, Vermont, said, we do not and cannot earn it by being good. All we can do is open ourselves to receive it. Going as far as we can toward God and trusting that God will meet us there. Jesus showed us. He modeled that way in his life, death, and resurrection. And there are two Greek words, kenosis and metanoia. Kenosis means self-emptying, letting go of our attachments and our ambitions. Metanoia means changing our hearts, minds, souls entirely to God. Kenosis and metanoia make us ready for God to take us through the eye of the needle. This is the formula, formula for transformation, emptying and letting go of everything and refilling it with the eternal love and life of Christ. God knows that's what you need to live. And that's the gift of grace that we hope for when all is said and done with what lies in this life and goes on to the next. Amen. Yeah.